The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Let's Talk More Action podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and should not be construed as advice, nor do they necessarily reflect the views of Community Action Council's governing bodies, leadership, or staff, or our funding partners. Community Action Council is a private, nonprofit, and nonpartisan organization. We do not support or endorse any political candidates. <laughs> This the city's number one podcast. Love the topics, the guests, and all of the contrast. They ain't focused on the views and the traffic. What's the point of shining if no jewels for the masses? We gotta spread the news of our passion. Service is a verb, now that's community action. Yo, everybody, let's talk. Nothing talking ain't enough, so everybody, let's walk. We all want freedom, the eagle and the stars. But the only way to reach it, meet the people where they are. Unity's the only way to fend these atrocities. You and me together can eliminate power. And this is just a vessel of expression to make sure we stay on the message of progression. Yes, everybody, let's talk. Bring your ideas and together we walk. Protect our seeds from the poisonous root and we gotta reach the source and the soul and the root. Yes, everybody, let's talk. We need community action. Together we walk. Together we work in to reduce violence. Speak through the airways. We refuse silence. Let's talk. You are listening to Let's Talk. More action. I am Cameron Minter. I am your co-host, and our host is the wonderful Sharon Price, our executive hey, director. Hey. What's up, Sharon? Hey, Cam. What is going on? Listen, it's almost Christmas. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. The blood. It's, it's flying by. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've did that, done that. You know, I miss both the holidays because I was sick. Sick with COVID during Thanksgiving, sick with the flu, and I don't want to repeat. So, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> well, I, I don't really know what to tell you about that. I but know. the year is flying by yes, already. Yes, it is. There's Can so you believe it? Yes, yes. You know, when you get older, time just flies. You know? I know. That, I to me, I, I mean, you know, people say two years, they'll be like, ooh, that's going to go by quick. <laughs> you know? Well, you don't think that time is going to. You know, just do whatever time does, yeah. but it, it does. And it, it waits, waits for no one. No one. Waits for no, no one. one. You know, you messing around thinking about it, it's going to take a long time and the time is going to pass, Lord willing, with you in it <laughs> or yeah, not. Lord willing. Yeah, Lord willing. It's going to happen. So mm-hmm. you can either decide to do something with it or just waste the time. Well, you're not getting ready to bring We ain't me down. wasting no time. Not, no, look, I'm just you're being not, real. You're not getting ready to, to mess with my spirit today. No, 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 no. We are going to have a wonderful time. Wonderful time on the show. We are because we, we have an incredible guest here. Okay. Um, that I'm so happy, you know, that, that she's with us today. We've got Layla um, Salisbury from the Kentucky Center for Grieving Children and Family. Ooh. And that is going to be, I think that this is one of the things I had a conversation with Layla and I learned some things about grief, Mm -hmm. you know, and she's going to let us know um, what the center does and all of that. So Layla, welcome to the show. Thank you. That was, that was actually a beautiful segue you had talking about Lord, Lord willing, (laughs) uh, you know, one, one of the things about loss is it reminds us. You know, we don't know. Absolutely. Um, you know how long we have, how long the people we love and are connected with have. Um, so you know, make make every day count. But you know, part of I I joke. You know, my job is to get people to have uncomfortable conversations they don't want to have. Yes. And when you talk about death, loss, Absolutely. and grief which is actually the experience that is the most human yes, and sir. connects all of us. And um, it's the one that hurts the most. Yes. I always and, joke and when people say, you know, tough. just getting old. And I'm like, well, there is an alternative. <laughs> well, there is an alternative <laughs> to getting old. So, no, and, and that's, I, I do find one of the gifts of, of grief. Grief grief is rough and, and terrible. I'm not saying, you know, we, we need to seek it out. Uh, it will find us. But... I think on the other side of it or a flip side of it, it reminds us of the preciousness of life and Mm -hmm. the, you know, making the most of the time we do have, I think, can Mm -hmm. be one of the takeaways uh, sometimes. That's not a not a bad thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is. Well, and you're the executive director for the Center um, for Grieving Children and Kentucky Center for Grieving Children and Families. But you 
you were brought this way because of a personal experience with your husband. Yes. If you'd asked me, you know, 15 <laughs> years ago, if I would be doing this, I would have said, you are crazy. What are you talking about? I have a career I like. I, I was doing something completely different. Um, my husband died by suicide. My daughter was five. And I quickly sort of became, had to become uh, an expert in parenting and in understanding things uh, about my husband's death and about ways I could help my daughter process that. So that, that kind of planted a seed. And, you know, I, I went, I was living in uh, Jackson, Mississippi at the time for my work. And so we had, there was a children's grief center there. And we started going and I found myself joking that I, I was going to move back uh, to my home state of Kentucky mm. and found Kentucky was one of the few states that didn't have a children and family focus center mm. for grieving. Um, and about the fifth time I made the joke, I thought, oh, maybe I'm serious about right. this. Right. <laughs> so, uh, right. it, it took uh, probably about seven, eight more years after, you know, my the initial loss. But uh, I, I eventually, uh, after another significant loss my mom um, who my daughter was very close to died unexpectedly right as my daughter was turning 13 and that uh, that loss in some ways was more difficult for her even than her, the loss of her dad because mm -hmm. it was sort of the second person and I, I think this is something you know if we don't talk about kids and grief enough we don't think about uh, kids and kinship care mm -hmm. or you know, sometimes the, the kids hear, you know, a teacher at school say, well, it's just your grandparent who died. Everybody's, everybody's mm. grandma died. But I think so many kids have incredibly close relationships For sure. with people in addition to their parents. Um, so I think kids can react incredibly strongly to those other losses. So it was seeing her struggle. And at that time, we were back in Kentucky. And there wasn't a, a children's grief center that we could turn to. And so I thought, all right, now now is the time to go ahead and, and do this work. You know, the funny thing about grief is that it affects people in different ways. And you, you look at people, um, I, the, the ones that, that kind of bother some of us is the people who are showing their grief. And, you know, saying, oh, it's all right. You got to cry. You got to, you know what I'm saying? But maybe that's not how they process it. But uh, from my experience, grief will hit you. And at its own point, it's going to take that time with you. Yes, there there is no escaping it. it. You can shove it down all you want, and it, it will come find you mm -hmm. uh, when, it, when it is ready. It's not going anywhere. And I, you make a really good point about you know, A, if we don't like to talk about grief at all, mm -hmm. uh, B, but then there are ways that, um, you know, kind of we all quote unquote agree on that's healthy grieving. Mm -hmm. Grief, as you say, can look absolutely different. And there are sometimes gender differences yeah. in how people grieve and especially with kids. So there's sort of no one way of grieving. And I think, unfortunately, uh, my daughter calls it grief policing. <laughs> There's a lot of grief policing that goes mm -hmm. on. You know, you're either crying too much or right, you're not right, showing any right, emotion right. at all or, um, you know, kind of. Uh, when are you going to get over it? Right. Mm, oh, that that's is something, worst. you know, adults listening, you have heard this. Those are things people will say to your kids, um, mm. you know, and, and the my intersection with this was the the child piece of it and just you know i've learned a lot both through talking with lots of different folks but even watching my own child people will say because of the way her dad died you know friends peers will say well you know your dad's in hell mm, right yeah, or yeah. um you know people will say all kinds of things and a lot of what they hear is you know it's been one month two months you need to get over it mm -hmm. um so kids are made to feel like they're not grieving right um, mm -hmm. in, so, in so many ways. So mm -hmm. part of it's just helping them understand there are a lot of ways to grieve and grief has its own timeline and it's going to be different from one person to the next. And one of the things that you've shared with me before is grief. We think of grief when we when a death occurs, but grief is not just when a death occurs. It could be a divorce. It could be, you know, yes. someone moving out or how households changing or something like that when it comes to children. Absolutely. You know, if, if we're not great at talking about death loss grief, the grief of parental separation, moves, big changes, 
Um, even loss of a sense of safety, you know, racial violence, racial injustice. Kids grieve that sense of safety in those moments. And if, if we don't recognize death loss grief, the most disenfranchised grief is those non-death losses. Um, and especially in school settings, um, you know, people just see the behaviors and they don't understand the, the grief behind those mm -hmm. behaviors. And that's really what I, you know, hope one of the things that the center can do is through especially working with school systems and districts is to help um, socialize both types of grief, the death loss grief and the disenfranchised unrecognized other griefs that, that kids legitimately have. And, and in general, our behavior is a reflection of something going on in our life. Yes. And so <laughs> uh, even, even the bad behavior or, you know, the things that are going on, we need to really investigate what's the root cause. Even at work, uh, you may, you know, you may have an employee who's been uh, top notch or whatever, and then all of a sudden they start falling off and, it's like, what's, what's going on what's with going you? On? What, what is the source of this change in our behavior? Yeah. So I can imagine with kids, I mean, even pet. Yes. Losing a pet. For a lot of kids, you know, that may be the first loss. Um, and so, you know, kids, depending on what age they are and what else is going on, you know, a death loss sort of breaks the world for a little person. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the first time they may understand you know, it, it's, the world isn't entirely safe. You know, mm -hmm. things happen, people, beloved pets go away and don't come back. Um, and that's that's tough for kids. And I, I think a lot of times, especially with littler kids, people say, oh, kids don't grieve, you know, especially kids under, you know, preschool age or younger, or they'll say kids are resilient, you know, they'll, they'll get over it. And I think that people don't realize how deeply kids grieve both um you know pets caregivers important people and peers uh, there was a, a study looking at um, youth involved in juvenile justice and it connected you know they interviewed a thousand newly detained kids and of those kids 90 percent of them had had a death loss mm. in the previous 12 months mm. and those kids would report an equal level of mental distress over the death of a peer to the death of a parent or primary caregiver and so I think helping people understand these things you know it may be a friend um, you know why they think oh well it just you know it wasn't somebody they were related to why mm -hmm. are they having this reaction and again you know depending on what age kids teens especially they identify with their peers and mm -hmm. so when you lose a peer that also, you know, a lot of things are going on. You're missing that friend. It usually changes the friend group that you had, you know, which for teens, that's a big and very hard thing. But also in their mind, then they understand, oh, somebody my age, mm -hmm. you know, can die. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that doesn't feel safe or good. And so there's a lot of grief that comes with that. I think we always try to compare uh, this generation to our generation. And we have to deal with uh, the differences. For one, social media is uh, one major difference that makes connections. That in our childhood, we played at school, we went home, we saw you the next day. Right. You know? But their friends are totally connected 24 7. Yeah. So it can Im imagine a loss of a friend. And especially, I mean, we're getting so uh, tolerable. Uh, that's not the right word, but. It's so normal to see children dying. And for our generation, it was not. Right. I mean, we, we have school shootings. We have all these different things that's impacting children differently than when we were growing up that we cannot really relate. And, and post-COVID, I think even pre-COVID, and I, I agree, so many things factor into that, social media. But, you know, the sense that we don't live in a safe world, and I think COVID really sort of blew that up because, you know, we were seeing that, you know, we didn't feel safe for a lot of different reasons. COVID impacted communities of color and youth of color who are now, you know, much more likely to have experienced death of, of caregiver, um, you know, increases in substance use, overdose deaths, gun violence, like all of that was happening at the same time. So you have a generation of young people who don't feel safe and who have a really increased sense of anxiety related to grief, loss, and just this, this lack, lack of safety. 
Well, and you know, we, with our Head Start program, we have, we service children under five years old, so we yeah. have the, the tiniest ones. And it's always feels uncomfortable when you have someone die and you're, how do you, as a parent, you know, because you want to protect them, right. you know, from the hard stuff, yes. you know, and not have those conversations, but maybe that's the wrong way to do that. Pa parenting a grieving child is one of the tougher things uh, that you'll have to do, and for exactly the reason. You know, parents, you want to protect your kids from this, but really what we recommend, it's actually healthier to have those conversations with very direct language using the words death died and there you know we can be a resource for helping caregivers um, and different types of death find find those that right set of language but it it is important and helps build trust in the long term if you can be open about it and i think it, i think it's okay for parents to say i'm sad too i'm yes you're, I'm dying over here. Your little ones are looking to you to model. How do we grieve? How is it okay to have feelings? And that's another, you know, important thing for caregivers to understand. You're the guide also for this little person. <laughs> the positive and the negative. That's, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we got to we got to lead by example. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and we'll be back talking more about this grieving. This past year has highlighted the strength of Community Action Council. Every day, our staff works together to help families recover from this crisis. We're educating children at home and in person, helping parents who lost their jobs, and helping households avoid eviction. Our work at Community Action Council has never been more important than it is right now. So why don't you join us? We have employment opportunities requiring a range of skills from entry level to advanced. Apply online at commaction.org. That's commaction.org. LIHEAP Crisis is operating now on a first-come, first-served basis. To learn more or schedule an appointment, head to comaction.org or call 859-300-6960. Community Action Council's Prep Academies have openings in their early Head Start program for children aged six weeks to three years old. Spaces are filling up, so now is the time to apply for the upcoming school year. Every child who enrolls receives a full scholarship for the entire school year. To get connected and ensure your young child gets a head start on their education, call Community Action Council at 859-233-4600. You can also find Community Action Council online at comaction.org. That's C-O-M-M, -M, action. .org. You are listening to Let's Talk More Action. We're talking with Layla Salisbury, and we are talking about grief. Now that's not a that's not a big happy subject, but it's it. You know what? It is not a happy subject. No, it's not. But it is one that we need to talk it's about. It's necessary. Yes. Everything it is. that's 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 profitable is just you know. Well, it's and you know, and we're always wanting to find resources for our families to be able to to work with their Head Start kiddos, um, and talking about it and finding resources is is one of the first things to do right yes and you know we are here to help uh, parents and caregivers guide those conversations at home especially with stigmatized losses um, you know homicide overdose suicide those are even harder to talk to the kids about because you're like, what's the right language? Do they understand? You know, the, the good news is there are resources out there to kind of give you talking points for, you know, what's language that a three or four year old can understand and how do you explain, um, you know, gun violence or an overdose loss and, and create the knowledge with for that kiddo that, I can I can talk to you about this, um, and you're a safe person for me to to talk with. Um, you know, with with little kids, people think they're not processing it, or kids at that age. You know, the, the parents out there who are listening know kids will bust out with. Uh, you know, they'll they'll talk about anything and everything, and not always in the they place. They will tell your business. Uh, oh yes, <laughs> in the middle of it. a restaurant, in the middle of church, <laughs> and then a circle time at school. It's all coming out there, and. Um, 
you know, kids share these things because it's a big thing that's happened Mm -hmm. in their lives. And they're kind of sharing to help process it for themselves. Like it takes, you know, little kids, you know, especially your head scart kids and, and preschool kids. Children don't have a concept of the permanence of death until more like eight or nine years old. Mm -hmm. So there's also a lot of magical thinking around a death loss at that age or a separation. So they'll, you know, they wish the person would come back and they'll, they'll even say things like, well, my dad died, but, but he's going to come back in a year or two. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, they just, you know, there's a, the brain is still forming. um, And so it's hard for caregivers to understand and you know, when kids do share this this business out in the world, they notice that it makes people uncomfortable. You right. know, kids are very observant, and they see when when I talk about somebody who's died, everybody else in that room gets real uncomfortable, mm-hmm. or they tell me not to talk about it, or I can read their face and know that, you know, that that's not okay. And so, unfortunately, they're taking their cues from that. And so the message kind of is, stuff it all down, I, you know, I don't want to make someone else uncomfortable. Or with l- kids of any age, they work so hard to protect their surviving caregivers, especially if it's been a death of a parent and they know, you know, when I talk to mom about dad's death, like she starts crying or I see her face and I love mom and I don't want to make her sad. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to act like everything is fine at home and I'm just going to keep it all bottled up in, inside. And I think, you know, something that parents and caregivers can do is just make it okay and say, you know, you might have a lot of feelings about this. I do too. Um, it's okay for both of us to feel sad or if we need to cry, you know, this loss is a sad thing. It's right. okay for us to have these feelings. I think just letting kids know, you know, that they – they can feel what they need to feel and they don't have to protect the other people in the house too. They, even from a little age, kids have a very strong sense of that, that you don't realize that because they're just putting all their energy into kind of masking it and acting like they're totally fine. Well, and you know, I've, I've talked to people that have, that have had a significant loss and, you know, when asking them, how are the kids? Oh, they're great. That doesn't mean that they're great, just because you're they, not talking about it. Doesn't yes, mean that they, they, want the, they don't want the parent to kick over to worry, so they, they're acting like they're great. And honestly, you know, depending on how old the kids are, especially with teens, you know, one of the hard, why grief is so tough is any and every reaction can come through it. I've seen two siblings, you know, lo- same loss of parent, same house. The teens are reacting 180 degrees differently. One mm. of them, you know, posting on Instagram, crying, talking about it a lot. Those are all normal grief responses. The other sibling, you look at them, and it was like nothing happened. Mm-hmm. Um, they're actually starting to do really well in a sport they're doing, you know, kind of like on the surface, they are living their best life. Mm-hmm. You know, both those kids are grieving, and it's just it's different timelines and different ways they're expressing it at that moment well you know I lost my mom almost two years ago and I am fine except when sometimes when I'm driving down the road and the next thing you want to know you're fine except when you're not fine I I get it it's been uh, five and a half years for my mom and they're still like, uh, you know a memory or a smell or something that will just wreck mm-hmm. you out mm-hmm. of nowhere mm-hmm. and you know when that's that's normal you know I, I've often heard you know it said grief is the price of love mm-hmm. you know we, we want high price it, it mm-hmm. is but you know one of the things for kids to and, and for ourselves that we can do at some point eventually you know, when when the memories come up or, you know, those things, the smiles first, maybe. And then you might get a little teary, like, a, mm-hmm. you know, creating, um, you know, one of the needs of mourning for adults, but, but also for kids is the continuing connection with that person who's died. So that can be done through 
um, you know, memorials, uh, activities, um, you know, creating at holidays. Uh, one of the activities we do with the kiddos, make a placemat, um, you know, in honor of the person who's no longer at the table, but there's mm-hmm. still a place at the table for them right. and you share right. memories, you know. So for little kids to stuff that's activity based um, can can be very meaningful. But again, giving them the space to talk about and remember that person, you know, even if they don't have a lot of their own memories, you know, you as the adult can talk about stuff that person loved, what they loved to do, you know, could they sing? What was Mm -hmm. the sound of their voice? Uh, What foods did they love? You know, we, those connections keep that person alive for us in some important ways over, over time. So if someone, if a caregiver finds himself in a space where a kiddo has experienced a loss either by death or divorce or whatever whatever that separation or loss may be, what is it that they, the caregiver can do? Do they call you and say, hey, what do I do? <laughs> right. What's next? Rescue <laughs> we, me, help we, me. We get that phone call a lot. I, I was talking to a, a mom. Uh, and again, this is a great example. It was a great uncle who had died. And, to, you know, and the child, um, you know, older elementary school age, really struggling. And again, everybody at school is like, that was just your great uncle. It's like somehow you're only allowed to grieve, you know, or somewhere, your immediate like certain relative. people or. Or, you know, um, and so, you know, I spent about 45 minutes on the phone just saying, uh, you know, hey, here are the programs we have for kids with the death loss. Um, You know, we've got uh, free community-based grief support groups. We also have an online teen group. If any of the listeners, you know, kids 13 to 18, that one's a peer-led group. So it is awesome. Um, You know, it's teens talking to other teens about, um, you know, their losses and some, you know, healthier coping skills. For the, the younger kids, kids. Uh, we have community uh, based grief support groups here in Lexington for ages 4 to 18. So kids are kind of split up by their age. And and I will say, your listeners, they hear like grief support group and they get a mental image and it sounds like the worst thing in the world. Everyone's sitting <laughs> around crying like no one wants to do that. <laughs> and because we realize like we're focused on kids mm-hmm. and then the caregivers. So we make it fun. The kids are doing activities, you know, things mm-hmm. to help them be able to talk about and acknowledge the loss, build those continuing memories and and bonds. And then we have the adults and caregivers meet separately. And we talk about, this is what's happening at home. I don't know what this is. Is this a normal grief behavior? Or, you know, what can I do? How do I talk about X? We also talk about practical stuff. Social security death benefit, uh, survivor Mm -hmm. benefit for kids is a very underutilized resource. Uh, Social security. I didn't even think about that, but that's that's really important for folks who don't know. Yes, only about half of the kids who have a parent who has died get that benefit. And it's a benefit per child, and it's a benefit that goes through the age of 18. So that can be a way that families can kind of shore up their finances because after a loss of a, you know, parent, surviving parent may be working two jobs right. or three jobs suddenly That's you know right. they may have to move um you know find, they may not be able to afford therapy for the kids or increased medical care you know sickness mm-hmm. you know the body grieves and so you'll notice like in the year or two after death everybody's sick all the time mm-hmm. or you know kids are saying i have stomach ache migraine headache you know so i, I calculated up one time extra doctor and therapist bills mm-hmm. in the year year after a loss and it was like five thousand dollars just for those copays i mean so it you know if there are benefits like this ssa benefit um you know that can really help kids and the families through especially the initial time but just shore up their financial security for a longer period so they're you know that's a great point i I tell people about that all the time because it's you know many people don't know And that's support for the, the parents as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, th- uh, there's no way you can leave where you haven't gone. So uh, if, if you're trying to help the child, you, you've got to deal with it yourself. No, and again, the uh, 
the caregivers, you know, what's, what's that old, I'm sure your parents, you know, in parenting classes, you hear this all the time, put your own oxygen mask on <laughs> first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's hard when you're grieving, the kids are grieving, you know, mm. do you put your own needs aside to try to do what you think the kids need you to do? So it's a real, it's a real dance. But if, if there are any ways, and again, you know, I think the social security benefit can, you know, just make it easier sometimes for the surviving parent to put that mask on first or get themselves the help and support that they need to to be able to be there for their kids. Layla, do you think that people come to you at the appropriate time? Um, How soon should people come to you after a loss? Yes. So our groups, um, I'm happy to talk to anybody, you know, two days after. And that's often when they'll call. And I can give them some resources, especially if it's even before a funeral or memorial service. How do you include kids in that? How do you talk about it? And, And I actually do recommend if kids want to be included, find a meaningful way that both you and they are comfortable with. Maybe it's placing a flower. Maybe it's singing a song. I've talked to so many grown adults who were not allowed to go to a funeral who decades later Mm. still resent that and feel a lot of unresolved feelings around Mm. that. So, um, you know, we can help kind of guide on that. And then doing peer support groups, usually about six months after a death is the right time. Um, because sometimes it takes a while for the shock to wear off, honestly. But what I will say, too, is we've had families who call us, uh, death loss was five years ago, you know, when the, the child was very little. But kids re-grieve a loss as they understand, and they'll often call us as the kids become to understand that death is permanent. Mm-hmm. And suddenly then all the behaviors are happening. Mm-hmm. So don't feel like just because the loss, you know, didn't just happen, um, our groups are very open-ended so we have kids whose loss might have been a long time ago but who need those groups right now and and we're here for them and we're open for that give us your website and your phone number your contact information before we yes go. it's www.kcgcf as in frank dot org um it's uh call us so you'll you'll get me on the phone uh 859-813-2759 and if you check the website honestly if you type into google like kentucky children grief it will will pull up and there are tons of uh, parent resources preschool toolkits sesame street has an awesome new set of resources for preschool age kids you know there's there's tons out there and and again call us we can kind of get get parents and caregivers started in the right direction with supporting their their kiddos and themselves thank you so much oh, this thank is you. so helpful helpful it's been great You have been listening to Let's Talk More Action. Thanks, Layla.